Okay, everyone. So we're starting chapter five, um, which is focusing on, um, we're still in the realm of equilibrium, but we are looking at um, acid base equilibrium specifically. So before we kind of delve into that, we're going to look at how we first identify what is an acid and what is a base, kind of like what the definition is. So there's two main theories that that we can define an acid and base with. The first one is being Arrhenius' theory. So this was the first idea of acids and bases, which looked at um, what happens when an acid and a base react together and what happens when ionic compounds are in water. So Arrhenius did a lot of work with ions and solutions. Um, the one we're going to look at later on, which is the more updated um, acid-base theory, is a Bronsted-Lowry theory of acids and bases. So Arrhenius is kind of like an older train of thought, but uh, it's a good place to start. So uh, his main idea was that when acids and bases react together, they form water and a salt. So remember when we say the term salt, we mean an ionic compound that does not have hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions, okay? So Arrhenius' definition of an acid is really any compound that when it dissolves in water, it produces a hydrogen ion, so it has to have a hydrogen in it. A base is any compound that really when it um, breaks down in water or dissociates, it creates a hydroxide ion. Okay, so acids have hydrogen ions, bases have hydroxides. So technically, a salt is any ionic compound that does not contain hydrogen or hydroxide. Okay, so here's a very simplified uh, reaction. So here we have hydrochloric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide, right? So the hydrogen and hydroxide is what's identifying that there. This is essentially a double displacement reaction. So the hydrogen and the cation with the hydroxide, in this case sodium, will swap places, giving us sodium chloride and water. Okay, so salt, again, this is an ionic compound that does not have hydrogen or hydroxide. And that's really what we're looking at here. Okay, so let's take a look here. So the first problem is basically looking at which of the following is an Arrhenius acid, whoop, Sorry, Ar an Arrhenius acid, which means I'm going to use an A for that. Arrhenius base, which I'll use a B. Salt, so salt you can really say, you can put an S or I'm going to put an I for ionic compound. Or molecular compound, remember, so ionic compounds is a metal, just to remind ourselves, with a non-metal ion. Whereas a molecular compound, I'm going to use an M. This is essentially non-metals only, okay? So right away, just identifying this here. So we have hydrogen with sulfate, right? So we have hydrogen ions. We know this is going to be an acid. Here we have xenon hexafluoride, which are all non-metals. So this is going to be molecular. So remember, things that are molecular compounds, they don't make ions, right? They stay in their structure. So this is actually acetic uh, acid. So it's hard to tell, but the C, CH3COO is actually the acetate polyatomic ion. It can also be written like this, C2H3O2, negative one. Uh, think of it as, it, it kind of just looks weird because it's a large polyatomic ion. But it's the same thing as when you see SO4 negative 2, right? It's just a cluster of elements that have an overall charge, which is what a polyatomic ion is. So here we have, this is of course an acid because we have the acetate with hydrogen. Sometimes you'll see it written in the front. Um, typically the reason why, just so you know, you know, hydrogen is usually written in the front except with acetate, uh, funny enough, or um, organic uh, polyatomics that have carbons in it. And it's because of the way that this structure is. I'll kind of just draw it for you briefly to give you a better understanding. So this is what the polyatomic ion structure looks like for acetate. 
So where the hydrogen actually will be attracted is at this location right here, where the, where the oxygen is off the C double bond O with the O. That's why it's written as COO. So the H is attracted to that oxygen, which is why they write that in together, just to kind of give you an understanding as to the reasoning behind that, okay? Uh, so that, regardless, that's an acid. So here we have the same acetate uh, polyatomic. In this case, though, it's with sodium. So this is just a regular ionic compound because there's no hydrogen or hydroxide there, right? Here we have potassium hydroxide, so this is going to be a base. Now, NH3, according to Arrhenius' theory, are all non-metals. This is going to be molecular, okay? But to kind of preview to you what will be happening, so this is our structure for, uh, this is ammonia. Ammonia is actually considered to be a weak base. So when we get into the Bronsted-Lowry uh, theory, we're going to talk about why that is. But for now, so they actually were specific here in saying Arrhenius base. So this is not an Arrhenius base because it does not have hydroxide. However, you will learn, and I will expect you to know later on, um, you know, not being specific to saying Arrhenius, but uh, ammonia is a base, um, meaning that it is able, it creates a solution that has um, a pH above 7. Okay, but for now, we're just following that original theory. So here we have uh, some reaction writing to do. So it says we have to complete the following neutralization reactions, which is another words of saying we have an acid plus a base reacting together, right, in a double displacement reaction. Make sure each equation is balanced and circle the salt that is produced, okay? So here we have acetic acid and lithium hydroxide. Right, so the hydrogen is going to swap with the lithium. So we're going to have lithium acetate, 3-H-C-O-O, three, three, -O -O, plus water, of course. So then this should already be balanced, and our salt is lithium acetate. Here we have hydroidoic acid and calcium hydroxide, right? So we're going to have the swapping happening. We're going to have calcium iodide. Ooh, that's a two, right? We're still doing crisscross rules when we're making new compounds. And of course, water. And then to balance this, you'll need a two and a two. Okay, and the salt is, of course, calcium iodide. Here we have magnesium hydroxide and phosphoric acid, right? So we're going to end up having water, of course, plus magnesium phosphate. Right, so remember you have a list of the polyatomic ions to also give you the charge on everything when you're doing the crisscross rule accordingly. So then to balance this out, we will need a three in front of our MgOH. We need a two to get our two phosphates. And as a result of that, we're gonna need six waters. And the salt, of course, is magnesium phosphate. Okay, so this is really, this section here is literally just practice writing out double displacement reactions. I know it's specific because it's an acid and a base, but it's no different than writing any other double displacement. Okay, so this part is interesting. So this is looking at, um, it's kind of working in reverse. So they're giving the salt that is produced from the double displacement reaction and they want to know essentially what the reactants were to make it, right? So it's almost like the products of, of the reaction are the salt and water, right? Just to kind of give you an idea of what they're asking for here. And they want to know what did you use to make those, okay? So obviously the, they don't really care about the water because they know you know that that's produced. But you're looking at the structure and saying, okay, well, what had to come together to make that, ion that ionic compound? So in this case, we have potassium nitrite. So the potassium came originally, maybe I'll make a little line here to give some space. So the potassium came from potassium hydroxide. And the NO2, which has a negative one charge, will need a hydrogen on it, right? 
So just a reminder for naming acids, by the way. So if you have a polyatomic ion acid, okay, so we call those oxy acids. This is just a little short review here. Your polyatomic ion, if it ends with A-T-E, the ending of the acid becomes ic acid. Okay, if you have a polyatomic that ends in I-T-E, so for example, the one we're doing right now, nitrite, this would actually become nitrous acid. So the eight becomes ic, the it becomes us, O-U-S acid. So that's why up here, so when I'm saying this, this is nitrous acid. Okay, over here. NH4 uh, and chlorine, right? So our hydroxide is actually ammonium hydroxide. So another way of how you're going to know what is matching with what, remember that hydroxides have a negative charge. So when you're placing it with something, that something has to have a positive charge, right, in order to make a compound. When you're looking at your hydrogen, right, the thing, the item, the ion that's matching with your hydrogen has to be something that's negatively charged. So going back to this, my chlorine is a negative charge, so I know that's going to be matched with my hydrogen. NH4 is a positive one charge. It's a polyatomic uh, ammonium. So that's going to be ammonium hydroxide, right? So over here, we have Cu which is copper, of course we know that is going to be a positive charge. And then C2O4, I believe that is oxalate. Let me just look that up. I believe that C2O4. Yes, that is oxalate. Okay, so it's, a poly, it's another polyatomic ion, right? It has a negative two charge. So this copper, must have a positive two charge, right? So it's important when you're doing charges because when I'm gonna put this with hydroxide, I wanna make sure I'm doing the crisscross rule properly, right? So it's not just CuOH, it's CuOH2 because it's copper two on the salt side. And of course, this is gonna be C2H2O4. So this would be oxalic acid, right? Because it was oxalate. And then here we have sodium acetate. So this is going to be acetic acid, right, with my H there. And then that will then be sodium hydroxide. Okay. All right, so here we have the Bronsted-Lowry acid and base theory. So actually, maybe I'm gonna pause this first part right now. Uh, it's a nice kind of spot to pause, and then we will do the new theory. This is the most up-to-date theory of acids and bases that we currently, um, currently still held true today. So we'll look at that in part two.